Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Pathways Health at Home learning session for May 2021. Um, this session is really special. We are featuring a new speaker uh, from the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency. And actually, we have four presenters today. So before we get into our discussion and the training, I would like to make sure that everyone is aware that we are recording this webinar for the purposes of learning um, and that we will send out an evaluation at the end of the webinar that we would hope you would all complete and that we also ask that you are on mute during most of the webinar so that the recording, uh, the integrity of the recording is protected. Um, and in addition to that, I just wanted to make sure that our speakers are prominently featured uh, in the Zoom. So we would ask that most folks stay off of video um, unless you have something pressing, but uh, we're gonna request that speakers continue to be on video throughout the presentation. Um, so I'm Heather Bates. I am with Transform Health, uh, part of the Pathways support team. I work on the Pathways newsletter and I help develop the learning community sessions. And I work in concert with a whole team of people that you already know um, on this end of things. But before I get into that, I just wanted to say um, that we are very, very excited today to offer this session with SETA. And you're gonna hear from William Walker, Terry Carpenter, Michelle O'Kam, and Julie Davis Jaffe about a variety of topics that I'm sure you're gonna have questions about. So I wanna make sure we get all of those answered. There will be a whole opportunity to post questions in the chat throughout the webinar. We will, we will respond in real time if we can to those um, via the chat. So make liberous use of that or liberal use of it. But we are also sending an evaluation out that we hope you'll complete, which we're gonna ask, you know, what are your needs? Uh, what do you need from SETA at this point in the program? And what would you like more of? And what are your outstanding questions? So please fill that evaluation out. Take as much space as you need. It's an open-ended question. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, our speakers are gonna be answering questions in the chat. So feel free to uh, post any questions that you have, but I will also be posing a few at the end. So that's the structure. We're first gonna hear from our speakers and then we'll do questions. But please feel free to use the chat um, as you need. All right, next slide. So the purpose of our training today is, is really in response to all of you. We heard from partners all across the Pathways program um, around the fact that there's a piece of this that we haven't really talked about, which is the need for capacity building in the area of workforce development and job training. So SETA in, in Sacramento County is the community action agency for Sacramento and they provide a slew of services. And we've been talking with them about some of the things that might be relevant for Pathways clients and patients. So we wanted to bring them to this webinar to make sure you all understood the variety of things they do and how to engage with them and how to plug into them. So. They assist communities of all shapes and sizes. We have briefed them on the Pathways community though. So this webinar will really focus a lot on that. However, you're gonna hear a whole list of services that they provide as well. And that includes everything from job training to placements, to refugee assistance, to nutrition to children, and so much more. Um, so I cannot wait to hopefully hear your questions, as well as talk through how SETA can be helpful to Pathways after this learning session. Next slide. Before we get into that, you know our ground rules. You've seen this slide before. Um, please use the chat box and uh, we are gonna make sure lines are muted as much as possible. Um, if we don't get to your uh, question during the webinar, we will follow up with you or you can email us at the Pathways inbox or you can contact any of our um, Pathways support staff and we'll be happy to respond and get you answers as you need. Um, this recording should be available shortly, if not today, by Monday, so you can reference it and or share it with staff who couldn't make it today. Next slide. So 
with that, um, I'm going to hand this over to our speakers. But before I do, I just wanted you to know that across the four presenters we have today, William Walker, who is the Workforce Development Manager for Employer Services and Special Projects, um, Terry Carpenter, who is the Development Manager for Sacramento Works and is in the Career and Job Training arm of, of SETA. And the next slide, please. Um, and Michelle O'Cam does workforce development and she manages those services. And Julie D Davis Jaffe is workforce development manager for SETA and Sacramento Works. Across all four of these folks, they have over 121 years of experience doing this kind of work. So there isn't a more expert group in town um, to answer your questions about job training and placement in Sacramento County today. So without further ado, um, I'm going to ask us to forward to the next slide and I'm going to hand this over to William to get us started. Each of our speakers will introduce a little bit more about themselves, um, but again, please use the chat for any questions that arise. William, take it yeah. away. Good morning, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, so, so SUTA is a multifaceted agency, and as you can read, we're a joint powers agency of the city and county of Sacramento. And what that means is that on our board sits two city council and two county board of supervisors. Uh, and they have been sitting on our board since 1978. Uh, our main function uh, is in this department is workforce development. So we cover a lot of different aspects of workforce development. As you can see, we, we are multifaceted. We do try to connect people to jobs and business to quality employees and education and nutrition. The education and nutrition part is our Head Start program. We uh, have one of the largest Head Start programs in the state. Um, around 2,000 students uh, participate in our program. And as you can see, you know, since COVID, we have kind of not had a lot of interaction with our kids, but we have not left our offices at all. We steady stay connected to the community. As you'll see going forward, our programs are always expanding to meet the needs of the community and the individuals that live in the Sacramento area. Uh, next slide. So, so next, I think Terry will be covering this part. Oh. Okay, so I, I'll go ahead and cover this part. Um, I, I was on mute, William. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I thought that was my part. <laughs> go ahead, Terry. Um, good morning, everyone. Terry Carpenter, Workforce Development Manager with SETA Sacramento Works, and we are delighted to be here with you this morning. Um, so as William was saying, um, Sacramento Employment and Training Agency, we've been around for over 40 years. And our workforce development program, Sacramento Works, is part of the SETA umbrella. And we have um, a board that actually over, provides oversight and policy direction for our Sacramento Works program. Um, so the focus is basically our whole mission is enabling and uh, focusing on inclus inclusive upward mobility. Um, the populations that we serve primarily in our system and our, um, our job center system and the other programs that we're gonna be talking about later um, is really those who have um, you know, significant barriers to employment or education. So a lot of our customers we serve are on public assistance, low income, but they're basic skills deficient. We serve a lot of veterans. Uh, disadvantaged youth is a, is a huge um, subset of our customer base and limited English proficient uh, population or customers, people with disabilities, and of course, justice involved. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, it is a pleasure to be on this call this morning and share all the great work that's being done in Sacramento County um, with our um, Workforce and Investment Opportunity Act funds. We operate um, 14 Sacramento Works America's Job Centers. And in addition to that, um, well, with the job centers, any individual is um, welcome to come into the centers, um, receive basic services, which can include some of the things on the list here as far as 
um, you know, be able to use a computer and work towards um, finding opportunities for employment. And then um, they also have more intensive services that can be provided, uh, which could include, um, if we jump down to scholarships, which could include training um, off of one of our um, approved lists, um, career assessments to determine interest of where an individual is or skill level. And then um, we have um, pre-employment services, which could be resume workshops, interview workshops, um, financial workshops. And then if we go back to employer and job seeking services, um, the job centers also have staff that will help with finding employers, um, working with our employer services department to assist those job seekers with um, obtaining employment. And then we have our uh, business information centers, which currently the one that um, is operating is out of the Hillsdale Sacramento Works America's Job Center. And that's where if you're looking at starting up your own business, you would be able to go in there and find assistance to working with um, our local um, um, SBA, you know, different agencies that help individuals start up working on their business plan. And then vocational training opportunities, that's um, where an individual, maybe they're not skilled at a level that they can um, find an opportunity to work in employment, um, which just brings in self-sufficient wages. So we would work with an individual to determine um, their interest, abilities, and then work them towards um, potentially um, a training opportunity that could lead them to employment. And that can be either classroom training or on the job training. Um, so yeah, we, um, do whatever we can to help an individual get back to employment. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to um, Terry Carpenter again uh, for the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, so this is something we're pretty proud of. Um, like Julie mentioned, our Sacramento Works program is federally funded. And um, we like to, because it's supported by uh, public funds, we really feel it's important to um, educate the public, keep them aware of the impacts that our program has and how the, the investments of public dollars really improve our community overall. Um, annually, we have helped over 48,000 individuals. And um, of those individuals, almost 65% are employed um, once they complete our programs. For every dollar that we invest in our job center system and programs, $3.40 is earned by those that we are serving. Um, that's money that's generated back into our economy. So um, we're proud of that fact. Um, the percentage with barriers, I think I mentioned before, we focus on those that really need that extra help um, to get moving forward. Um, and so we, our percentage with um, barriers to employment is 90.7%. Um, and average annual earnings that um, individuals increase their earnings is 35,922. Um, that's our average annual earnings for the program. Um, so next slide, please. So um, employment prep preparation is one of the um, strong focuses of the Sacramento Works um, Workforce Board and the Sacramento Works Job Center System. Basically, this is the flow of our activities of what we're trying to do as an individual enters our door. And our front door to our services is, um, is our job centers. So we look at improving basic skills. We have assessment tests that offer remediation tutoring programs so they can increase their basic skills level in reading and math, for example. There's learn, um, we use, um, Process, but we also use work keys, which is recognized nationally by employers that uh, it's a system that's used to get um, basic skills, test individuals for their, you know, ability to um, locate for information. It may be tied to uh, reading for detail. And it's basically set up by what the employer's looking for, but we try to prepare those individuals for either is the training program they're interested in the right fit? Are they gonna be able to complete that? Do they have the basic skills to be successful um, for both employment or training? If it's job, um, after that, we look at their basic skills, what they're looking for, what their desires are, their interests. Then we look at their job readiness. Is their resume prepared? Do they know how to interview? All of these services are part of the job center system. 
Um, we have coaches that work with individuals um, on a regular basis. We have workshops, as was mentioned by Julie, that range from financial literacy to, um, you know, how to network and, um, and look for a job, you know. What's the hidden job market type of thing? What's the other things you can do versus just applying online, for example? Those that need occupational skills training, we work, we are, SETA and Sacramento Works is not a trainer. Um, we work with those organizations that specialize in training. So our partners were um, heavily um, involved with the community college system, the adult ed programs, and, um, and our local universities. We try to focus on short-term trainings that will get an individual ready to get a job that's in high demand that will help them support their family in a, in a self-sufficiency wage that also offers them career advancement. Um, so if they don't, let's say they're job ready now, they don't need training, then we work with them on employment. And once they complete their training program, we're there for them to help them with um, the next step, which is to attain employment. So that's our employment activity flow. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, the last thing I forgot to say um, here is that, as you can see that popped up on the slide, safety net services, um, we have a lot of different funded programs that are um, delivered through the Sacramento Works Job Center system, which can provide additional supports for individuals that need, maybe they need support with their utilities, maybe they need uh, work boots, maybe they need assistance with travel, uh, gas cards or bus passes, light rail passes. Um, those are all types of services that we provide under what's called safety net, so that when they're in training, we can support them so they can complete it. Um, for employment, we need them to be stabilized and housed so that they can keep that job. So safety net services are a very important part of what we do. Next slide. As I was mentioning, the America's Job Centers of California Network it is our front door to all of our services. And we give access to basic education general education, uh, GED prep, we work with all of the um, programs so that we can help individuals get their high school diploma or a GED, for example. And we do vocational English language training for those that need assistance in order to be able to communicate to get that job. Next slide, please. So here you can see our 14 job centers. Um, SETA is not only a provider of services, we're also a funder of services. Our 14 job centers are also supported by community-based organizations because our premise is that we need to trust in the community. We need to have, for them to have access to um, the services within their neighborhood so that they can get, get those services. So we fund um, many organizations throughout our community, as you can see here, that operate our job centers, La Familia, Folsom Cordova Community Partnership, Asian Resources, the Urban League, um, El Grove Adult Community Education, for example, 14 locations throughout Sacramento County. And our website, sacramentoworks.org, has a, um, a page just with the locations that provide the hours of operation it also gives you information on the uh, languages that are actually spoken by the staff that work in those centers so that we can provide those services to individuals who need some assistance with language. Um, so sacramentoworks.org is our uh, website of record that you can always find all the information. Google map pops up. It's very easy for the client to, to, to see where we're located. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. Thank you, Terry. Yes, um, when Terry was talking about safety net services, we have, in addition to our Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds, we receive multiple different funding sources through the agency, um, which other managers will discuss uh, more later. Um, one of them though is the Community Service Block Grant funding. And this funding, um, we currently are operating, um, as usual, our regular CSBG funding, which is a program year. Um, and then we have the CARES Act funding, which many agencies are providing CARES Act funding throughout um, the County of Sacramento. But CSBG itself has been around for 57 years. Um, and the purpose of CSBG is to be able to help those individuals who are in poverty, to help them 
when they're in need and try to move them forward um, to become self-sufficient. Uh, so we have multiple, I think between CSBG regular funds and CARES Act funding, we have about 40 plus programs that are being ran currently in Sacramento County by um, some of them are partners that are actually job centers. Others are other um, community-based organizations um, in Sacramento County. Um, and then we have integrated CSPG services into our America's job centers so that that, that way um, individuals can um, receive those safety net services um, as they're looking for employment. And uh, let's see, and then we have a difference between safety net as far as services. Safety net services is that um, I need that gap to um, to get to their job because they just aren't quite making enough to be able to afford that transportation. And in some cases it could be, I just received a rental um, eviction notice. So I need some assistance so I don't lose my housing. And that's where these agencies are able to help in that area. And then we have the self-sufficiency services, which if we go to the next slide, I can go into a little bit more on that. And here we have a diagram that shows that there's no wrong door to services. We can have an individual that can show up at what's the name, um, um, Salvation Army, and they're in need of finding employment in addition to having some of those safety net needs and be able to be referred over. To, so they may come through CSBG services and they may get enrolled into a family self-sufficiency program within CSBG, and they'll be able to be case managed, um, receive those support services. Um, they'll also um, provide follow-up to make sure that they, just because they get a job doesn't mean that they're gonna be, uh, there's still some assistance that could be needed at that time. And then um, as the job center system, an individual may come in that needs those additional assistance uh, um, that a CSBG provider may be able to help with. So we would refer individuals that direction while simultaneously we would both be working with the individual. And, um, and then for that's how we operate. We, look at the individual that comes to our centers and our, any of our services. And we look at what additional needs do they um, have so that we can then connect them with the appropriate partner um, and or funding source to do wraparound services to those individuals. And because um, the whole goal um, so that that way they can um, have a healthy happy, you know, future in the, uh, along the way. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Michelle Ocam to talk about job seekers with disabilities. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Ocam. I'm another manager in um, with the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency's Workforce Development Department. Um, I am fortunate to oversee disability initiatives for our workforce, um, the Sacramento Works uh, Job Center system. Um, I also oversee services to English language learners and um, in particular services to newly arriving refugees um, that have found Sacramento home upon entry into the United States or those that travel to Sacramento as secondary migrants um, that may resettle in another state or another county within um, the state of California and find their way to Sacramento and we help engage them and connect um, in partnership with Department of Human Assistance to employment. But my um, focus today will be on the Job Seeker with Disabilities program. Um, for those of you that aren't aware that um, there is a large number of individuals with disabilities that live in our county. It's um, well over 180,000. Of those individuals, approximately 80% are unemployed, which means that individuals with disabilities um, have a weaker attachment to labor than those without. And that is our focus, how to, how to change that. Um, challenges faced by individuals with disability 
first and foremost, fear of discrimination. Um, if they're on supplemental security insurance or social security disability insurance, it's fear of losing, um, the, of course, the cash benefit, but probably more important, the health benefit, what working will do to, to, um, to uh, their, their benefits. Um, sporadic work history. Um, another challenge is that services for individuals with disability tend to be very fragmented, which require individuals to access multiple doors and multiple service providers, um, oftentimes services provided in a siloed manner. Um, also longer term engagement required um, in obtaining employment, especially those with developmental disabilities. Um, and then finally, there are um, employer, oftentimes m employer misconceptions about hiring individuals with disabilities. So when developing strategies and programs um, to serve this population, always in the forefront um, are these challenges and how are we are going to, going to best address those challenges. Um, so key initiative and program components and service strategies um, have been establishing disability service coordinators located throughout the job center system, which you've heard a lot about this morning. We have 14 centers. Um, the set of hosted centers have um, coaches within those, those centers that we have worked with and, and assisted with developing their uh, professional capacity to better serve individuals with disabilities. Uh, that training is ongoing and we continue to recruit um, other coaches that are interested in working with individuals with disabilities on a, a voluntary basis. We feel that we don't want to assign um, individuals to work with a certain population. We feel that if we, uh, if it's a volunteer, then we're going to have people that are, um, they're more invested in the effort. We also, uh, another key strategy is promoting a centralized service model through cross-system training and, and coordination to reduce the service fragmentation. So that's with our many partners that are connected to the job center system. We also build upon ex and expand upon partnerships including community-based organizations. You heard Julie mention um, how critical it is to connect to our um, the populations. And the way to do that is through neighborhood centers, which are community-based organizations. We do a lot of work with resources for independent living. Uh, we do work with um, NorCal Center on, uh, 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 on deafness and, and others. Uh, we place a special emphasis on increasing alignment and co-enrollment with Department of Reha Rehabilitation um, adult, and educa adult education and community colleges, uh, college district, Alta Regional Center. We'd have a lot of um, coordination and partnership with Alta Regional, which, which as you know, focuses all services towards those with developmental disabilities. And then also other, um, we connect with other vendors on, of the Alta Regional Center's disability vendor list. Um, also, another key strategy is to expand employer and business engagement by educating them on the value of hiring skilled job seekers with disabilities. Um, and then finally, we um, strategies include increasing outreach to our SSI and SSDI beneficiaries under the Ticket to Work program to provide access to benefits planning um, so that they can really understand what working, what working may do to impact their benefit, um, to offer work incentives, and to coordinate the delivery um, of workforce services and resources while providing a a safety net for those beneficiaries, so they're able to um, try the world of try out the world of work without fear of immediate loss of cash and health benefits. So we help them through that process. Um, guiding principles uh, to promote the social and income mobility of individuals with disabilities—that's overarching goal. I think that's for all of our employment programs and all targeted populations. But that is also kept in mind for individuals with disabilities. No wrong door access by promoting. I mentioned before cross systems collaboration, thereby creating more entry points for individuals with disabilities um, to practice and promote cultural competency. Oftentimes people think of cultural uh, competency related to a race, race or ethnicity, um, but we're talking about cultural competency in, in terms of the world of disability. Uh, to promote integration of service access, shared decision-making and success principles through integrated resource teams, which are multidisciplinary and coordinated with our partners throughout the system. And then also the, the, the final guiding principle, um, as you met, heard me mentioned, uh, strategy is to minimize service fragmentation and increase the streamlining of resources and services to support the success of individuals with disabilities. 
Um, we've been fortunate to, uh, in terms of our um, targeted grants to serve individuals with disabilities, we've been fortunate to secure a number of grants throughout the years. Um, I didn't, haven't listed it here, but we, we did receive um, in collaboration with the state of California disability employment um, initiative funding, which helped us really um, launch the professional development of our coaches within our system. So we use that funding for um, training and professional development, which just um, increased our ability to better serve individuals with disability, to better coordinate with Alta Regional Service who um, works with developmentally disabled. There was a, a more confidence with um, Alta um, to send individuals with disabilities, developmental in particular, to our job centers and know that they're going to receive quality service. Um, we just recently were awarded another round of Disability Employment Accelerator grant funding, which is funded out of the governor's WIOA discretionary allocation. Um, this grant will run for two years. We just received this, this round. Um, this is our fourth round of funding. And um, the intent is to accelerate employment and reemployment strategies of individuals with disabilities through earn and learn opportunities like such as OJTs and through education and vocational training. Um, SETA is also and has been since 2006 uh, a contract and employment network with the Social Security Administration under the Ticket to Work program. And um, through the Ticket um, to Work program, we're able to transition people from reliance on public disability benefits to gainful sustained employment. We currently have just a little over 155 um, tickets assigned to our employment network. Um, well over 90 of those individuals are currently employed. Um, and keep in mind, many of those on SSI are those with developmental disabilities. So we're really proud of that. And we continue to increase the numbers um, of individuals uh, that are ticket holders that come to us to access services. Um, we do hold ticket to work orientations. Um, through COVID, it's been, a little, uh, it's been a little choppy. More often than not, we're providing one-on-one -on -one orientations and we do have a hotline that individuals can contact us through as well as an email um, address that I can put in the chat, place in the chat. And then also for individuals, if you are seeing um, a number of your uh, clients that you're serving or cross paths with individuals that are refugees or special immigrant visa holder, holders from Afghanistan or Iraq, or they're asylees, or they are certified victims of, of trafficking, they are eligible for Sacramento, for SETA's Refugee Support Service Program, which I oversee, and I'd be more than happy to um, assist in connecting you to our wonderful service providers throughout the county that we have funded to provide services to those refugees. Um, so uh, take it away to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So um, as you've been hearing from many of us this morning about the different services that we provide to individuals to help them with um, job training or employment or both, um, we also provide no cost services to employers. Um, so that we can connect the individuals that um, come through our job centers and all the various other programs that we operate um, to connect them to employment. So for employers, we offer um, a free job posting service. We um, uh, are affiliated with CalJobs, the statewide um, labor exchange system. So it is a statewide system. So we post jobs for free for employers. Um, we also send that out on our network of over 400 different organizations to help expand the reach to um, get the candidates uh, aware of the job opportunities that we have available. We also do customized recruitment events for employers, so little mini job fairs um, geared to whatever um, positions they're trying to fill, fill at the time. We also do um, screening services for employers. So a lot of times, you know, we can save employers time and money, which is a great benefit because we can screen the resumes and the applicants um, prior to referring them to their um, positions. We do career fairs and community events where we try to support um, and be at the events that are focused on employment and training in our community, as well as other resources, community resources. Um, so we really try to support our community by being visible and participate in various events. Um, 
I mentioned earlier about the skills assessments that we do to make sure that we can help those individuals increase the basic skills they may need to um, complete a training program or to just um, compete successfully for an, a job or the employment uh, type of job they want to get. Um, we do inter interviews, orientations, um, and recruitment space. So we have um, sometimes there'll be employers that uh, will be coming into this area, but they haven't officially you know, got their building open or ready to interview um, because they don't have a space. So we provide employers with a space so they can conduct their interviews, do their hiring, um, hiring practices that they need. And um, so that's another service we provide. Um, our, um, for those organizations that may be downsizing or uh, reducing their workforce, we have a program where we work with those employers to assist those employees that they're letting go or reducing their staff that are going to be let go by doing specific targeted job fairs for those individuals. Let's say someone was laid off from uh, Verizon back, um, that was a few years back, quite a big, a huge layoff. We were able to um, set up a targeted job fair for those individuals with different employers that their skill sets would automatically transfer over to. And it was very successful. We were able to move a lot of those individuals over to employment that were laid off from Verizon. As an example, that's what we do for any employer who's reducing their workforce. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to William. Hi, I'm back. Um, you know, Terry didn't mention that we, we actually do uh, have been doing virtual job fairs. We just recently did a virtual job fair with the state in which 43 departments participated and we had over 760 individuals actually attend that virtual job fair. So those are things that we will be doing in the future as we get back to what the new normal looks like. But uh, uh, we, we have done that and we'll continue to do that going forward. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is some of our initiatives. We, we have several initiatives that are directly tied to the state of California. Uh, one of those initiatives is prison to employment initiative. Someone did ask in the chat, do we serve 290s? And I know I know what a 290 is, and we do actually do provide services 290. 290s. Um, SETA really has been working with this population for about 15 years. We've had several programs uh, outside of outside of Sacramento that we work with the uh, actually the California Department of Human uh, California Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. We have had staff that have worked in Folsom prison uh, with people who are trying to get into the uh, workforce from prison. And we also have had staff that has worked have worked out at Rio Consumers Correctional Institute uh, in the same capacity of reentry. We're currently running our prison to employment program, which we are serving individuals who have been recently released from prison or county jail prison and on parole. And we are trying to transition, transition them into employment. One of the things that we have experienced is that um, quite a few individuals uh, have gotten into employment. And what we do know about this population is once they become employed, the likelihood of them recidivism, recidivating, recidivating is uh, slim. Once they get start to working, they will continue to work. We currently have been received an SB1 uh, award from the state of California, uh, which will be helping us work with individuals who want to get into construction. Uh, as you can see, we have several projects here in, in the area that deal with construction. Uh, originally, we, we, we started working with the city of Sacramento on the Golden One, uh, building the Golden One. That's where we actually kind of cut our teeth on working with construction and construction sites. What that has brought us to is two projects that are highly uh, visible in the Sacramento region. Uh, we work with the Department of General Services on their construction of state buildings. Uh, and if you can see, go down Richards Boulevard, you'll see a high rise, uh, which is actually um, the, uh, I guess the state warehouse and part of it is a park, parking structure. And, and that is um, actually due to be finished in 2022. Also, there's another building on O Street. Uh, it is uh, the Department of General Services new home uh, that will be, uh, they will be moving into that in uh, 2023. Um, 
the city of Sacramento is also working with SUTA. Uh, if you see these local projects uh, that are going up, they're, they're small, they seem to be nuisance, nuisances projects because they, they, they clog traffic and they create a lot of havoc, but those are the city's projects and we're working with them to get individuals to work on those projects we call priority workers. Probably the most prominent uh, project that you'll see is the Notomas Community Center, which we're working with them to get individuals out to those di different job sites. So I, I just wanted to add that none of this that we're doing is new. All these special projects are additions to our workforce development projects that we currently run through our regular uh, formula funding. We, SUTA has been in this business 43 years. And for the most part, we add on to everything that we do. As Michelle was mentioning, you know, our CSB, I'm sorry, our ticket to work program, our refugee program has grown immensely because there's a confidence in what we do and the service we provide. Our CSBG program, Community Service Block Grant, has been with us for all 43 years. And we have continued to provide excellent service and it continues to add to what we do. So none of this uh, that we do is uh, lost on the community. We work heavily with the community-based organizations to make sure that they're in the front. So you don't always see us out there uh, as being uh, a player in this game, but we're always the group that's behind the scenes, actually trying to orchestrate and keep things funding. So again, uh, it was my pleasure to bring this to you. Um, I'm passionate about the agency and what we do. And I'm sure that my fellow coworkers who I've worked with for years, so it's almost, it seems like we've been together for 121 years. Uh, but I, I don't think it has, but we've known each other for quite some time. So we work together as a team and we actually try to provide some, some worthwhile services to the community. Uh, uh, the P2E contact, would be myself or Mario Montez. I'll put my email address in the actual um, chat room and uh, chat box and you can actually uh, contact me directly. And, and that's it for me. Um, I just wanted to Thank add you. that, I just want, last thing I wanted to add, Heather, is that um, I know we didn't mention it um, today, but we also have a lot of uh, programs that help youth with employment and training. Um, they're year-round programs, and that information is also on the SacramentoWorks.org website under the Youth tab. All of our special youth programs that we're running in-house, are you can apply online for those as well. So just wanted to mention that. Terry, no, that's you great. Link in the chat box. Thank you. The yes. Yeah, thank you. That is great. Um, thank you so much. Really, that was a phenomenal amount of information. Um, I have a few questions teed up on my end that I'm going to pose to you all, but I'm also going to ask that folks put any questions you have in the chat. If you don't feel comfortable asking it there, you can email us or you can put it in the evaluation. Either way, you will get an answer to your question. Um, I, be I believe William and everyone on this call are very dedicated to what they do. I know that in our planning for this webinar, we've learned a ton about all the ways that SETA can be helpful in our community. And so we strongly encourage you to take advantage of these resources, however they fit within your programming. Um, my first question though, is I'm wondering if, you, if one of you or maybe several of you could talk about the types of skills or jobs that are sort of in demand right now um, and do a little forecasting about just what are the skills and jobs that seem to be um, coming up since we're hopefully uh, surfacing from this pandemic and um, just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. I'll let Terry, cause she, she does a lot with the 21st century skills. She can certainly speak to what employers are looking for. Well, I think, um, Heather, weren't you looking, um, wasn't your question geared more to what the, uh, the types of employers that are hiring the, was that what your question was referring to? Open-ended. Uh, oh, okay. Employers, trending, job skills, any oh, of the above. 
Okay. Um, so I can answer the 21st century skills. Um, you know, we've been like, we've been in this business for a long time as you, as we, you know, 121 years between all of us or something. But um, the, the employers keep saying the same things. It was the same as 10 years ago. And it was this, uh, the same as it is today. It's, it's really soft skills. Lawyers are looking for individuals they can train, but they need to know that they can work as a team, that they have good communication skills, uh, both written and verbal, at least be able to do emails with um, and use an email system, know how to go on the computer, use the internet. Um, and they need to, they, you know, are they resilient? Can they show up? Um, are they problem solving? Can they think on their feet? Um, those are some of the big things that the employers are looking for today. Digital skills is important. Um, you know, we're in the technology age. We have been, it's the 21st century and it just keeps moving faster as we all know. And uh, those digital skills are even, are important more today than they were just even a year ago because as technology moves forward, many more things are getting automated. It's really having, um, you know, no fear of the computer. You, you really need to be able to embrace technology. And so that's the other issue, other thing we're seeing a lot. Um, Wim, you wanna talk about some of the um, um, employer focuses that you can see as far as hiring? You, you know, I, I have experience working with employers that they're, they're not so much looking for those hard skills because that they can train. They're looking, as Terry said, for those work maturity skills for, for people who are being to work on time, showing up and being present, uh, having good uh, teamwork type skills and working together. Case in point, uh, the, the building trades. You know, a lot of people think construction, that you have to go to construction with those skills. And in fact, you don't. And in fact, they don't want you to have the skills as a carpenter when you go to construction. What they want you to have is the ability to learn and the aptitude to grasp what they're trying to teach you. They can train you to be a carpenter, but they can't train you to be a responsible employee. And that's really what they're looking for, responsible employees and people who are committed and present at the job at all times. And I'll just add to what um, what Terry and William and Echo, um, everything they've said thus far and what you'll find, what we're seeing is oftentimes employers are eliminating the education requirements, even the state of California for their top analyst position, the AGPA used to require um, a bachelor's degree. So we're finding that they are really looking at work experience, those soft skills, the ability to work as a, in, in a team environment. Um, and, uh, and, and willing to train someone in the technical skills. So they're reducing, eliminating the, the educational requirement and, and hiring people knowing that there's some skills gaps, but those soft skills are there. Um, and so, yeah. So um, there's some more questions in the chat. Um, Heather, did we answer your question? Um, I, I just you feel did. like there's, okay, great. We might There's want to a move. lot, but I think I think in terms of the chat, I think just uh, it relates to another question that has come up, and they're sort of synced. So I'm going to combine these, if if we will. So, um, what are the ways that Pathways uh, case managers and and um, Pathways team folks um, can plug in and engage with SETA? So, so what what do they do to work with the job site, say, and then? Let's say they've identified somebody who might be a good candidate for training or digital skills training or what have you. Just can you walk us through the sort of pipeline that happens um, and what pathways uh, case managers are to do to plug in to you all? Julie, did you want to take that question? The okay, sorry, well, I was trying to respond to a question. Uh, question. Oh, so what was the sorry. question again? Sorry. Oh, um, it was basically what what does a customer expect um, if they come into the door of a job center and what's the flow of how they're helped? OK, so the customer flow. Um, yes, yeah. what happens is when a customer first um, shows up at the center during COVID, it was a phone call to the center and then they would get linked to a coach who would then do assessments and move them through the system. But now um, since things are opening up, a customer would um, go to the job center and it still could be via phone, but 
but they would uh, meet with a coach to determine what are their needs. And that's where we would assess, do they have that need where they need some assistance with transportation? Um, could there be CSPG services? Uh, maybe it's um, referring them to a refugee provider. Um, and then what we do is once the assessment's done and we determine what um, services are needed, if they're just wanting basic services, we would have them um, register in our CalJob system, which anybody can do from home. They don't have to come into the center. So if you go to sacramentoworks.org, you can go in there and register. And then you would um, be in our system. So each time you come to the center or you log in from home, um, the coach can see what activity is happening with them. And then what we would do is if they're wanting more intensive services, a coach would then um, meet with them more frequently, one-on-one, um, -on -one, help them work out a employment plan to guide them as to, um, you know, based on assessments, what skill sets are they lacking? What skill sets do they have? Um, what direction do we need to go? Do they need to go get their GED or high school diploma? Um, jump right into a training program, or maybe they don't need training. They just need help with those basic employment skills like interviewing skills, resume workshops, and they'll guide them. So there's not every customer is going to come in and receive exactly if that makes sense. Um, and then we guide them, you know, all the way through. Um, if they're in training, we monitor them on a regular basis to make sure they're doing well inside the training. And then um, whether they do training or not, we work towards employment. So we work with our employer services department, our job developers, and um, help the customer, you know, see what employers are I'm in with location for doing interviews and, you know, follow once they get employment, um, we follow them for another 12 months to make sure that the employment stays. Um, if they're having that employee, we would guide them on how to assess that situation. And then if everything is going well, um, we sure um, thing for the next 12 months. Julie, you're cutting out. I know. We're having trouble hearing so, you, Julie. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me, but. Okay. I can, let me pick up from, okay. um, I think. Okay, me, yeah. You. Going back to the, okay. the, the question Thank that you, came, Michelle. The, yeah, the question that, that was asked about how do the practitioners on the call today connect to our services? What would if I had a client sitting in front of me today, what would I say to them? Um, so you saw the map of all the job centers um, geographically located uh, throughout the county, and um, the rule of thumb is take a look at where where they reside, where your client resides. Um, and connect them to the job center closest to their location. And, um, and we, we do have a, there is a job center roster that has the hours of operation, the phone numbers, the email addresses, and uh, the names of the organizations. So we can certainly make, make that available, but that would be the first, the first little, um, thing I would do, I think, as a, as a, a practitioner. Um, and then just know when you're sending someone, they are going to get, a, you know, as, as Julie was mentioning, a very comprehensive assessment. So it's not just about what's your former work experience, you know, what's your um, financial status, what's your education. Um, we take a look at the, the full life domain of the individual. We need to know if there's health, health, health insecurities, um, is there housing and food securities? Are there family and friends supports? Um, do they, um, uh, what's what's another one? You know, you may you may be setting up a plan for someone and not be aware that they have an uh, an adult child at home who is in need of, because they're developmentally disabled. Perhaps they may need 24/7 care. So if you're setting up a plan that doesn't take that into consideration, where they're in training, education training, you know, five days a week, and you're not taking that into consideration, if you're just setting the that individual up for failure. So um, we really do take a look at that full life domain as. Um, Set, make that full life domain assessment of the client. And then when we're talking about our programs, services to veterans, services to individuals with disabilities, English language learners, you know, one, those are derivatives. So you can be an individual who is, you know, an individual that's a veteran, but you're also a disabled, but you also are an English language learner. Um, and so 
the coaches at the job centers take that into consideration and look at all the different services and resources and targeted programs that could be available to that individual, um, not just one disability program. So that, was that is very helpful. Thank you. Um, I know we put the map back up. We would like to share the roster, I think, with the Pathways listserv, if that's possible. Um, and, the, and those on the webinar, because I think people are very eager to make those connections. I realize though for pathways, it's, it's very city focused and this is countywide. So one of the things I wanted to mention too, is all of you have different jobs. You don't just work on pathways, presumably, um, at least some of you may not. So we wanted to make sure this webinar uh, was available widely. Um, so we do recognize there are more folks on the call um, than pathways case managers, but in general, I do want to focus on one aspect before we um, close out, and it's that if someone is experiencing homelessness and then they're being served as a pathways um, client, are there recommendations that you have for uh, that population specifically? How do you interact with someone who doesn't have a home. Um, does that come up in in sort of the coaching that you do at the job site? And if you could walk us through a story uh, or a client experience in that way, um, it would be really helpful for the folks working with this population just so they can visualize how to plug this into their pipeline. I would say Julie probably. I, I have a story. Yes. I I was I was worked. I I ha, I am still working okay. with a, a young Go woman, ahead. a young lady who actually got out of prison. She had no home or no place to stay. She was in one transitional housing experience, and she was trying to transition to. I believe a McClellan has a has a, a transitional living quarters out there and, and and what she needed was someone to actually help her pay the rent uh, for her transition. So she had to pay the rent. She had to pay, I guess, whatever first and last month's rent. So we actually assisted her with the first and last month's rent. And she also needed someone to pay, uh, I guess, where she stayed prior to moving to this transitional housing. So we actually helped pay that as well. So we, we do have the ability to help people pay for housing. Now it's not a long-term solution. It's a short-term solution while they get, they become stable, hopefully an uh, employment. This particular person had employment. So she did have a job uh, available to her, but she just needed the rent to be paid. So we paid the rent. And at the next time the rent was paid, she was able to pay her own rent because actually she got a job as a construction worker, uh, which was, was, was admirable. Uh, and we continue to stay connected with this person uh, as they move through their career path because they, there are changes that she's making. There are adjustments she needs to make. And our coaches, once they start working with an individual, they kind of stay with that person until they become self, self-sufficient uh, to a level uh, that we don't, we, they no longer need to have us there for them every moment of the day. And Julia, okay. I know you might have a story as well. So, yes, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, yes, we've had. Um, I'm, you know, work with the Continued Care Board. I'm on there as well, because um, part of Community Service Block Grant funding, as well as our job centers, is all about helping those um, that really need the help. Um, so we've had individuals, there was an individual that came into our Hillsdale site who um, his wife in the center was all frustrated. Staff let him use a phone. Once he used the phone, he, you know, calmed down. They were able to talk with him, found out he had nowhere to sleep. So they were able to instantly get him set up in a shelter for the night. Then um, he and gave him bus passes so he could come back to the center and he did and started working with a job coach, um, was able to find someone to couch surf with. And then um, he ended up interviewing for Solar City, got hired on there. And um, he was participating in our, what we called plugged in at the Hillsdale site. 
whereas a group of individuals looking for employment, um, within, I think it was two or three months, he had a job. And this was during the holiday time. So he was able to start in January working for Solar City. Well, on his days off, he actually continued to come back to the plugged in sessions and then eventually was actually recruiting from the class um, for other individuals to get employed there. And he was able to obtain housing um, because he had a job where he was able to afford housing. So there's all different ways individuals come to us um, in need, but it is looking at how do we use those wraparound services to make them successful? Um, we have a lot of connections with our you know, housing um, and I'm trying to establish even better relationships for referral. One of my CSBG staff is currently working with a lady who is living in her car, but we're hoping to get her into the Mather housing in the next, um, they have like a three month waiting period. But meanwhile, we're working on um, finding other solutions to that, which may be staying at a hotel, um, but getting her into that housing so that she'll have that while she's um, seeking employment. Uh, so um, as you know, like in William's story, I mean, there, there, there's so many different ways, but our goal is to provide what they need at the time if we can find that resource, if it's not something we provide ourselves. And hopefully that helped. Yeah, I think it did. Honestly, I think it's really important to hear the story so that we understand. I mean, this work is not black and white, right? Information is presented in a very didactic way, um, but we realize that this work is not linear. And so I think anytime we can talk about a real life situation, it's important because it's hard to figure out how they fit in or how I fit in, say, to this process. Um, so I think, uh, as Lisa was saying in the chat, it's really important that we illustrate the link between homelessness, housing, employment, and healthcare, because I think we all know firsthand that if you do mm -hmm. not have, if you are not healthy, um, and you are homeless, or you are homeless and you are not healthy, those two are intrinsically linked uh, forever. So um, with that, I think what we're going to do is uh, just mention that we have an evaluation survey. There are some open-ended questions uh, that will be going out to you all by email and you see it in the chat. Please fill that out. It really does help us determine next steps for our speakers and what you might need more of. But in addition to that, I just want to take a minute to thank um, the SETA uh, crew that I think are now part of our Pathways family. I don't think we're going to let them go. I don't know what you all think, but um, I just would like to say thank you to William, Julie, Terry, Michelle. You're fantastic to work with, and I look forward to um, a continued collaboration with you all on behalf of the city and beyond. Um, so I know everyone's on mute. Uh, we're going to stop the recording.